Good morning. We'll try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. It's so good to see you this morning. I want to ask you, we are going to pray in just one moment. Larry Bowman uh, collapsed in the Sunday school class over in the ministry center. Um, he is alert, but not real sharp on what year it is. So we don't know exactly what's going on. The paramedics are here. The ambulance is here. They're dealing with him. I'm sure they're going to take him to the hospital. So They've gone. They've taken him. Okay, praise God. So uh, we're going to pray. Um, Rick, come up here, please. Come up here. And let's pray for Larry. Um, and then I'll just share one quick announcement, and we will do that. Rick was in there. Rick, pray for him, please. Pray with me, please. Father, as we come to you this morning, we have a special prayer that we lift up to you. Watch over our brother Larry Bowman. Be with Linda. Watch over him as they go to the hospital and have the physicians to talk and take care of him. Just be with them so that they can guide him, know what to do. But we turn him over in your care. Father, it's through your hands your hands that we can get the comfort, the understanding that you're there watching over everybody, listening to our prayers, and we know that this is going to be the thing that needs to be done. Let each one of us pray that Larry will be all right, that the doctors can do what they need to do, and as always, Father God, as we watch over him, just send the love and the care and love. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Just let me encourage you about one announcement. You'll read the rest. But Tuesday at 10 o'clock, the new uh, uh, edition of Grief Care begins at Grand Community Baptist Church. Folks, if you know any person who is grieving in any way, they need to be a part of this group. It is tremendous. Our team are spectacular. They do a great job. And I encourage you, if you're grieving, please come Tuesday, 10 o'clock. Choir, no rehearsal till next Sunday. Got one more week. You're welcome. Amen. <laughs> Tell Gary. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Folks, we're here to worship. Let's worship the Lord Jesus. to his house and gathered in his name to worship him. Join us, will you? We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. And magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship Him, Christ the Lord. Will you stand with me? Come, Christians, join to sing. Alleluia. our King. Alleluia. Amen. Let all with art and voice before His throne rejoice. 
praises his gracious choice. Alleluia, man. Come lift our hearts on high. Alleluia, man. Let praises fill the sky. Alleluia, man. He is our guide and friend. Tell us he'll condescend. His love shall never end. Alleluia, man. Praise yet our Christ again. Father God, this morning we bow in your presence. Thank you, God, that before we ever say a word, you already know every need we have. And thank you, God, that you promised us that if we would gather in your name, that you would come and join with us. And so, Lord, we know right now you're here. Thank you. Thank you that you care for us like you do. Lord, today I want to come and bring some prayer requests to you. I pray for Dee Dee Mays. Lord, I thank you that you have been with her following the death of her husband, Dick. <clears throat> thank you, Lord, that now you're with her as she is at Sante so that she can regain her strength. And Lord, I pray quickly she'll be out of there. I lift Carol Wright to you today. Lord, you know that her sister passed away and she's grieving today the loss of her sister. Thank you, God, that you know how to comfort Carol and, and meet every need in her heart. Again, Lord, we thank you that you're with Larry Bowman, with Linda right now as they're at the hospital. God, you know every need that he has. And Father, you know that there are, are a number from Grant who are battling the flu Others who are battling illness in many ways. Some of our folk, Lord, are battling with cancer. And God, thank you that you know every need before we ever mention it. Thank you, God, that you know exactly how to minister to those needs. Thank you, God, that as we speak this moment, you are already actively working to heal, to comfort, and to guide. Jesus, we love you. Lord, today speak to our hearts in this time of worship. And that is our prayer in the powerful and sweet and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. If you're a first-time visitor, we'd like to take a moment and just tell you welcome this morning. We'd also like to ask a favor of you to just take a moment. And in your bulletin, you'll find a yellow slip of paper. It looks like this. If you're a first-time visitor, give us a little information so we can get to know you. And then if you as a visitor or you as a member have a prayer request, you'd like to get it on our prayer sheet on Wednesday nights, take a moment, fill out the back side of that yellow slip of paper. Oh, how he loves you and me. 
We're going to sing a song, Jesus, our great Savior, Jesus, friend, lover. He loves us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It tells us in John. Let's sing it together. Jesus, what a friend of sinners. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me. He, my Savior, makes me whole. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. Jesus, what a strength in weakness. Let me hide myself in thee. Tempted, tried, and often failing. He's my strength, my victory when. Hallelujah, what a Savior. What a help in sorrow Where the billows for me roll Even when my heart is breaking He's my comfort, help my soul Alleluia, what a sin Saving, helping, keeping, loving, He is with me to the end. Jesus, I now, now receive Him more than all in Him I find. He hath granted me. Forgiveness, I am his and he is mine. Amen. What a savior. Hallelujah. What a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. Sunset at evening, the wonder of sunrise I see, but the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all. Just to think that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all. Just to think that God loves me. There 
There's the wonder of springtime and harvest. The sky, the stars, and the sun. But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the one that's only begun. Oh, the wonder of it all, oh, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. In this very room, there's quite enough love for one of us. And in this very room, there's quite enough love for one like me. There's quite enough hope and quite enough power to chase away any gloom. For Jesus, for Jesus is in this very This very room, there's quite enough love for all of us. And in this very room, there's quite enough joy for all of us. And there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to share where we go. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus is in this very room. Stand with me, will you? Think about that. In this very room, there's quite enough love for all of us. Why? Because Jesus is in this room. We sang at the beginning, we have come into his house to worship him. As the pastor said a minute ago, he promised in his word that where two or three are gathered in his name, he would be there. Think about that love. There's enough love in here for all the world. Let's be sure to share it this week. In this very room, there's quite enough love for all the world. And in this very room, there's quite enough joy for all the world. And there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to change all the earth for Jesus. Is in this very room. Good morning. Good morning. Scripture reading this morning is John 13, 1 through 17. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart from the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things to, into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from the supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded it around him. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet 
and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent, sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Let us pray. Fathers, we come to you this morning. We have asked many favors of you already today to, to heal the sick, to be with Larry. And Father, that truly is our prayer. But this morning, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for caring about us and loving us, watching over, taking care of our needs, giving your son for us. Father, that's the only way we can live in this world, with that eternal hope. And we're so grateful, and we're grateful for your word that instructs us how to treat each other, how to love each other. And Father, we just this morning, we just ask that you would touch every heart here today. Father, I pray that when this day a sermon is done this morning, that we will all understand a little bit better, be able to live a little bit closer to you. Father, we just are so grateful that we have a country where we can do this so openly. Thank you. Father, now as we come this time to take our offering, Father, I pray that you would just put your hand upon it, touch those with that money that are touchable, that the Holy Spirit's already talking to. Father, I pray across this country and this world that your Holy Spirit will just work wonders this morning and bring many souls to your kingdom. And Father, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
I, uh, was amazed this morning to watch as the fire truck pulled up and firemen jumped out and every one of those guys grabbed equipment and headed into our building and so professionally took care of Larry Bowman. Um, and as I was standing there watching, um, a thought went through my head that those same, same men who were there, some of them down on their knees, um, taking care of one of ours, if the building had been on fire, they would have run into the burning building to get me if I was trapped in that building. Yeah. What is it that causes someone to serve like that? Soldiers who go to war knowing that they might die for our country. Policemen, firemen, ambulance drivers, first responders who every day know that today their life could be put on the line. What, what is it about that that causes them to want to serve like that. Today we come to a passage of scripture. I am not back in Philippians. I promise next Sunday we'll be back in Philippians, okay? Philippians 4, we'll be there next week. But today the Lord laid on my heart this passage of scripture. It's a passage of scripture we recently looked at on Wednesday nights. And I am blown away by this story. It is probably one of the most profound stories in all of Scripture. It is the story of Jesus as he washes the feet of the disciples. And in this story, we learn a tremendous truth. And the tremendous truth is that every single one of us who know Jesus Christ, who love Jesus Christ, who are his, you and I, have been called out by Christ to serve. We are to serve him. We are to serve others. Today I want to talk about what do you do with dirty feet when no one else in the room would do the job of the lowest servant, the lowest slave, Jesus volunteered. There are three things that we see in this story about what Jesus knew, what Jesus did, and then what Jesus taught that we need to get today. So first of all, if you're taking notes, there's an outline in your bulletin. I hope you'll write a few thoughts down. Number one, as we consider that you and I ought to be a servant, we need to understand what Jesus knew. This passage of scripture is incredible, and, and, and it tells us several things, and when you first start reading the story, it's almost as if John begins to tell this story, but then he just will have a little brain lapse for a second, and he jots down something interjecting things into the story. So the story says, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, and then all of a sudden he goes, Wait a minute, I need to say something about Christ. So he says, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, and then he goes back and says, having loved his own, da-da-da-da. 
But it says that Christ knew something. Well, what did Christ know? Well, the first thing he knew is found in verse 1. And it says in verse 1 that he knew that his time had come, that he would go from this world and go back to the Father. Now, what is John talking about here? Can you all hear me? Praise God. Okay. What was John talking about here? John was saying that he knew that it was time to die on the cross. And he knew that it was that time. Now, I want to ask you something. If, if, if you knew, by the way, I, I don't want to know when my time to die is. Just let it happen. Amen? Do y'all want to know? Would you want to know if tomorrow you were going to die? Jesus knew. Jesus knew the next day he would die. He knew it. The story says he knew it. He knew the next day he was going to die. And so an amazing thing occurs. He doesn't say a word about it. He doesn't say a word about it. Do you know what he does? He comes and teaches his disciples this profound lesson. He knew that it was time to go back to the Father. He knew that he was going to die. Then there's a second thing that he knew. and th This is really incredible. I, I, I want you to get this. John says then in verse 3, he kind of tells the story there. By the way, do you see there in verse 1 it says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I want you to know that, that John comes and tells us right there, I, 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 we knew that he loved us. We knew that he was thinking about us. We knew that he cared about us. My friends, I want you to get this. Everything that Jesus did was based upon love. But when Jesus got down on his knees, washed the defeat of those disciples, that was from a heart of love. Do you know what's going to solve most of the problems in America and around our world today is for us to have that kind of a heart of love. A heart of a love that looks at a person and doesn't see color. A heart, of a, a heart of love that looks at a person and doesn't see whether they're rich or poor. A, a heart of love that just says, I love you for who you are and I care about you. The Bible says Jesus loved his own. By the way, it's going to tell us in the very next verse that Judas was going to betray him. He knew that. We're going to come to that in just a second. But, but it says that Christ loved even Judas, even when he was going to betray him. My friends, love would solve a lot of things. But then I want you to come to verse 3, and it says in verse 3, Jesus, now it says he knew something else. What does it do? No, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and that he was going back to God. It said Jesus knew three things. What did he know? He knew that God had given him all things. You know what that means? Now, now, that could mean a ton of things, but I want you to get this. Do you know what that means? It means that Jesus knew he was Lord God Almighty. Christ knew that he was God. Do you get this, my friends? Jesus knew that he was God. Jesus knew that he did not have to do what was about to happen. Jesus knew that he could stop it at any second. Jesus knew that he was on in charge and that he was in control and that no one was going to force him. My friends, I want you to get this. When Christ went to the cross, he went voluntarily. No one made him go. He could have stopped it at any moment, and Christ did not. He knew that he had come forth from God. He knew that he was going back to God. My friends, do you want to know the answer to being ready to die? It's knowing Jesus. He knew that he had come forth from God. He knew he was going back to God. Listen, none of us will be afraid to die. Now, I need you to hear this very carefully. I am not anxious to die are y'all God made us want to live okay I am not anxious to die but brother I'm ready my time comes I'm ready let me go don't stop me let me go okay I'm ready to die you know why because I met Christ because I turned from my sin and came to know Jesus as my savior you you, you need to know the father 
the Bible says that Jesus knew who he was. My friends, I don't want to get into a lot of uh, intellectual gobbledygook, but may I say this to you? You need to have a good self-image of who you are. You know, Jesus knew who he was. He knew he was God. He knew he was God who had become flesh. He knew that he was going to go back to God. He knew all of those things, and therefore, he could get down on his knees and be a servant. Jesus knew those things. But then there was a third thing that he knew. We see it in verse 2, and then we see it again in verse 11. Verse 2 tells us that Satan had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, who was the son of Simon, that he would betray Christ. Judas had already put the plan into motion. He had already gone and met with, the, with the, the religious leaders. He knew it was coming. Christ knew that Judas had done that, okay? Because verse 11 says that when he said to them, you're not all clean, that one of them in the group was not clean because it was Judas. He knew who was going to betray him. My friends, I want you to get this. In a moment, Jesus is going to get up, do all of the things that we're going to talk about. He is going to go around, and, and the story does not say that when he came to Judas Iscariot, that he said to him, you're a scalawag, you are slime, you are scum. He could have said that. He could have said that. You know what he did? He washed his feet, just like every other disciple. He washed his feet. As we studied that on Wednesday nights, I have seen, I have heard other authors say the same thing. But my friends, I think Jesus knew that if Simon had changed his mind, God would have figured out another way to got Jesus to the cross. Okay? He was giving Judas every chance to back out. He was giving Judas every chance to repent and come back to God. He gave Judas every opportunity to, to turn away from that hideous plan. But the Bible says... Jesus knew that Simon was going to betray him. And yet, in just a moment, he would wash his feet. Amazing. <clears throat> if you come back tonight, we're going to look at Paul in the book of Acts, and we're going to see that some men plotted to kill him to the point that they even took a vow they would not eat until they had killed Paul. Now, I want you to know those fellows went hungry because it was years before Paul died, okay? Or, or else they broke their word, one of the two. But they hated Paul. They were going to try to kill Paul. My friends, here's the reality in life. If you choose to live for Jesus Christ, there are going to be some folks that may not like you. There are going to be some people that may not want to be your friend. And I need you to get this. There are some that will even be your enemy because of your love for Jesus Christ. Now, you need to understand that that's true. But I want to ask you this. If God wanted you to, would you wash their feet? If you knew that they were an enemy, would you still wash their feet? Jesus, knowing, knowing that Judas was going to betray him. Washed his feet. We see what Jesus knew. It's incredible. There's a second thing. Number two in your outline then. I want us to look at what Jesus did. What did Jesus do? Well, the first thing I want you to see is that he gave us an example. He, he'll say that later on, but he gave us an example. Now, folks, I want you to get this. Um. Christ could have just skipped down to verse 12 and taught the disciples about being a servant. But did you know that the greatest lessons learned are, all, are awesome, are often. Do you ever get your tongue over your eye tooth and can't see what you're saying? I do that once in a while. Are often the best lessons are the lessons of an example. Of someone showing us how. Do you remember when men, when you learned how to tie a tie, do you know how to tie your own tie? Could you tie one? I could tie one without even looking. Amen. You know how I learned how to tie a tie? I watched my daddy do it. And then he helped me, you know, showed me how to do it. 
But, it, but he was an example. He tied a tie in front of me and showed me time and time again till I got it. Uh, Jesus was an example to the disciples. He didn't just say, be a servant. Jesus became a servant for them. He showed them. He was an example to them. But then I want you to see what he actually did. This is really cool. It's, it's an amazing thing to see what Jesus did. So go down to verse 4. Okay, uh, verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come forth with God, was going back to God. Verse 4, he got up from supper, laid aside his garments, taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples and wiped them with the towel with which he was girded. Here's what he did. Jesus did several things. Number one, he got up. You know what he had to do? He got up. Now, do you know how they ate? They laid down. I want you to know, I've not ever gotten to do that, but one or two times, it's the most awesome thing in the entire world. To lay down on some kind of cushion and put your hand under your head and lay there by the table and just kind of fold her in there. I got to tell you, that is glorious. That's how they ate. Jesus was laying down there with all the other disciples, and and they were reclining at the table. And, And the story says, you know what Jesus had to do? He had to get up. Folks, you know the first thing, by the way, uh, I may not have said this, and if I haven't, ex- pardon me and excuse me, but I did say to you that God wants all of us to be a servant, right? And God's going to tell you some stuff that he wants you to do as his servant. And do you know the very first thing that has to happen if you're going to do the things that God wants you to do? you got to get up. Do you all have a favorite place in your house? Do you know where my favorite place in my house is besides the dinner table? That's probably the number one spot, but the number two favorite place in my house, anybody want to guess? My recliner, who said that? You got it right, amen, my recliner. Do you know why I like my recliner? Not only can I sit down and watch TV, I almost lay down. There's something about that laying down thing that's kind of cool, I got to tell you. You know, kind of good. Amen. You can prop it. You can get in that chair. You can kind of lean back a little bit. But then you can catch that handle and go whoop. And your feet pop up. Isn't that right? And pretty soon, man, you're almost laying down watching TV. You know what happens in that recliner sometimes? I nap. Y'all ever do that? Now listen, I'm just telling you what it's like, amen, you know, you got to get up. You know what I have to do once in a while? I have to go do something and, you know, I got to get up out of that chair. Now, you know what happens after you sit still in a recliner for a little while? When you're 62 or older, it's hard to get up. Do you know what we got to do? If we're going to start, listen to me. If we are going to start being a servant of the Lord, you know what has to happen? You got to get up. Satan will tell you, isn't that chair comfy? Yes, it is. Isn't that chair comfortable? Wouldn't you just like to stay there forever? Got to tell you, that's tempting, right? You got to get up. And then the story says, after he got up, he took off his outer garment. Now, we finally figured out that probably Jesus had on some kind of undergarment that covered the basic thing. He had on underwear, okay? But he took everything else off. So he took off his robe. I started thinking about why he took his robe off. We didn't talk about this. The nastiest job in the world was washing someone's feet. Do you know why? Because they walked in sandals most of the time in sandals or barefooted. They walked on roads that were not paved, so they were dirt-covered roads. But many times there was more stuff on the road than just dirt. In towns, do you know what was on the road? Human sewage. Ooh, that's gross. 
animals walked down those roads, so there was animal sewage on the roads. The person that washed the feet of someone was washing dirt, but was also washing sewage off of their feet. You would not want to get that on your nice, clean clothes. So the servant that did that literally would strip down to his boxers. My friends, that is an incredible picture. Sometimes in our lives there are things that get in the way of us serving God. And if we're going to serve God, you know what has to happen? We have to take them off. We have to get them out of the way so that we can serve the Father. So I want to ask you this morning, what is it in your life that maybe right now is keeping you from serving God as you ought? He laid aside his garment. Then the Bible says that he took a towel. They always had a towel by the basin for the washing of feet. He took that towel and he wrapped it around his waist. Now you say to me, Pastor, what was that about? Well, they had to have the towel to dry the feet off. It's the best place to carry it, to keep it out of the dirt, was to wrap it around your waist. Then it says that he took the basin, the bowl, and he poured fresh water into the bowl. And then the Bible says, I want you to look for these words. It says, and... He began. Folks, you got to get up, but then you got to start. At some point, you, you could, you, listen, you know what will happen? We'll prepare ourselves to death and still not do any serving. It says he began, started doing it. And so he went to every disciple. How many of them were there? Twelve. Twelve guys, one at a time. I don't know about y'all, but do you know how you, what you have to do to work on feet? You got to get down to the feet, right? Now, I don't know how y'all get down. The other day, there was some tape on the floor out there. We were cleaning up, so I volunteered. And so they were saying to me, Pastor, can you get down there? I got down there. I even got back up. Amen. You know how you know? Because I'm here today. Amen. I got back up. But you know what you got to do? You got to get down. If you're going to get down where feet are, you got to get way down there. I told him the other night, it's like working on a toilet at your house. Have you ever had to work on a toilet at your house? My friends, the only way to work on them babies is to hug them. Now listen, that's right. The only way to work on a toilet is to hug it. Now you say to me, that is gross. Listen, think about feet with sewage on them. It's gross. Isn't it? It's gross. You know what Christ did? He got down on his knees. Maybe even got down to where his rear end was sitting right on his feet. And he took dirty feet and he washed them. He got all of the dirt and the sewage off of those feet and then took the towel and dried the feet. What an act of service. What an act of love. You see what Jesus knew, but then you see what he did. He assumed the job of the lowest servant and he washed the feet of the disciples. What? What an incredible story. But then we see the third thing, and that is what Jesus taught. What Jesus taught. Now, there are three things that we need to get real fast. So notice in verse 12 and following what happened. Jesus looked at the disciples, and he said to those guys, do, do you know what I did? Do you know what I did? 
And the story indicates that before they could say much, if anything, he just started talking. Okay? But he asked him a question. Do you understand what I just did? Now, I need you to get this. Probably in all likelihood, when he asked that question, they went, hmm. Do I really get what he did? Does that make sense? Did it, did it sink in? Did I catch what Jesus did? So he tells them what he did. What does he say? I am your teacher. By the way, that's the word rabbi. And it meant someone who was their teacher, who taught them, who schooled them, who was training them. He says, I am your teacher. But then he says, and Lord. The word Lord means master, the one who is over the slaves. He says, I am your teacher. I am your master. I am over you. But I, as your Teacher and master washed your feet. What was he saying to them? You need to understand that no matter who you are, no matter how great you think you are, no matter how wonderful or, or all of that that you think you are, all of that great self-image, I need you to get this. You need to be ready to wash somebody's feet. Now, was he saying to us, let's start a brand new ordinance, let's do something brand new, so every feet, let's bust the water out, because you see, we don't have that issue today. Do you know why we don't have that issue? There are several reasons. Number one, the sewer's not in the street anymore, it's underground. All the roads just about are paved, and we wear shoes and socks, Right? So we don't need to wash someone's feet because they're covered up. They're okay. What is Jesus saying? Is he saying we need to start washing feet? No. You know what he's saying? You need to be willing. Here's what he says. You need to be willing to be a servant. You need to be willing to serve. By the way, can y'all find me anywhere in Scripture where there's an expiration date on that? Even as we age, I don't see an expiration date. I don't see that when it says, did you know that there's only one place that I found in Scripture where it says you can retire? It said the Levites could retire at age 50, by the way. I thought that was kind of cool. The Levites could retire at age 50. It's the only place I find retirement in the whole Bible. Although I got to tell you, it's smart. You know, at some point we wear out, we need to slow down. But you know what the Bible, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where serving the Lord and serving in the church and doing all of those things ever stops until we stop. We're called to serve. Jesus says, you, no matter who you are, no matter how important you think you are, no matter how whatever you are, you need to be willing to serve. So he says to them, here's the lesson. Wash one another's feet. Do the work. I pastored a church in Lubbock, Texas that had all ages. I got to tell you, in a way, I miss vacation Bible school. Now, in a way, I don't miss vacation Bible school. But in a way, I miss vacation Bible school. And there would be times we'd have 100, 150 kids and workers and for three and a half hours, it was bedlam. Anybody that volunteers to work with children, you are out of your mind. <laughs> but 
You know who I miss? I miss teenagers. Some of you are going, you're out of your mind, brother. You know who I used to love to work with with teenagers? Junior high kids. We called them electric chihuahuas. That's, that's, that's junior high kids. I loved it. I loved it. You know what I found? You had to have people that were willing to be in the nursery with babies. Do you know what? Babies cry. Babies poop and wet their diapers. You have to change them. They get mad. Kids, you know, kids. What what else do you need to say about that? Children, teenagers. As soon as I said teenagers, some of y'all went. (sighs) You know what? Somebody has to. To work with those guys. You know the most rewarding things in church are working with kids. Now, we don't have any kids. You know why? Because we're all beyond that. Thank God. Do you know there's still lots of cool stuff that goes on here? Do you know what that requires? It requires people who are willing to do what? To serve. So Jesus said, you need to wash. You need to serve. You need to do ministry in whatever way I'm going to call you to do. But then I want you to come and look real fast at verse 17 and we'll be done. Verse 17, Jesus says this. If you know these things, do you see it? If you know these things, that's that's awesome. No. No. He says, if you know these things, you are blessed if you, what? What? Do them? He said, you got to know them. My wife has a saying. She tells our children quite often, even as young adults now, they still hear this from their mama. Knowing and doing are two different things. You can know to do it. You know, Jesus doesn't say knowing it's great. He says knowing it and then doing it, you'll be blessed. Here's the rub. We know that God has something for us to do. Here's the rub. Will you do it? What do you do with dirty feet? When no one else in the room volunteered, Christ got up, took off all of his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water in the basin, picked up the basin, and went around the room and washed the feet of all the disciples. Let's, you and me, be just like Jesus. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you how it speaks to our hearts. God, as we come to begin this new year, thank you for reminding us, Lord, that each of us are called. Each of us are called to serve. Each of us, Father, are called to serve you in the ways that you would speak to our hearts. So God, touch us and call us out. And God, help us to be willing, just like Jesus, to serve. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. My friends, if you're here and you've never met Christ as Savior, I mentioned that briefly, but I can say to you, the only way you'll be prepared to go to the Father is to know Jesus Christ in a personal way. And if you've never come to know him, we'd like to help you do that right now. Just come, take me by the hand, say, Pastor, today I want to give my life to Christ. We'll help you make that commitment of your life to Jesus as the Savior and the Lord of your life. Maybe God is speaking to your heart about some other commitment. If so, you come. Maybe you need to join our church. Maybe you just need to come and, and, and just get on these prayer benches and pray. If you do that, we'll leave you alone, okay? But, but we want to pray with you if you have a prayer need.
Whatever the need, that's the invitation. Stand together. And if you need to come right now as we sing, you come. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender. Jesus, I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now, I surrender. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Remind you that at 6 o'clock tonight, we'll be back. We'll be in Acts, I believe it's chapter 24. Don't hold me to that. I looked at it earlier, but I've slept since then. So praise God. But we'll be back in the book of Acts tonight. It's going to be a great time. We'll worship the Lord together. And so it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a great day. Amen. Praise God. Uh, Alan Bacon is going to come and close us in prayer. Thank you, Brother Alan. Our Heavenly Father, it has been good to be here today in this blessed, sanctified place. You have called us to come, and we have responded. Lord, it's been one of those recliner moments in our life where we have been basking in the love and instruction and presence of our Lord and our God. And we do thank you for the joy and the blessing. Now, Lord, as we go our separate ways, we could come to that do them portion of our life of service as ambassadors. Help us, Lord, to be fruitful. Help us, Lord, to be willing to do those things you've instructed us to do. And Lord, as we do them, may we remember the words of Peter as he closed out his second letter, where he instructs under the power of God's Spirit, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.